Um, so, before we start, I'll just say a bit about me, because so it's kind of, well, it's kind of interesting to me, it's probably not so interesting to you, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, I, I used to have a real job, um, which was, I, I, I've been an IT manager, I've been a programmer, I've been a consultant, I work for a company called Admin Management Services, we worked on network management, I spent three years as it happens working at GCHQ as a security advisor, um, and uh, about five years ago, I discovered there's this really great job you can do where you don't actually have to break anything anymore. No one tells you off. Um, you don't get into trouble because you've done the wrong thing. Your projects don't fail, etc., etc. And it's called an industry analyst, which uh, uh, when I found that out, I, I, I jumped at the chance to, uh, to do this. And what, what industry analysts do, because um, it was a new thing to me when I discovered it, was they try to do the things that people who are in real jobs would love to do if they had the time. I, I think that's a good summary. So essentially, we spend our time trying to understand all the different technologies that are out there, trying to understand best practice, understand markets, understand the vendors and what they're trying to um, sell, and uh, whether or not it's any good, um, and really where, where the, the rubber hits the road for us, where it gets very interesting, are in areas like interoperability, architecture, process, management, so on and so forth. Because, well, I, I've been in this business for about 20 years. I, I was at university um, 20 years ago doing a course called computational science, which sort of dates me a bit. Um, but back then, I thought that you know, 10, 15 years later, it would all be finished, it would all be done in some way. And I think we all keep that in the back of our heads that in some way technology will be, you know, at some point be done. But um, I think I've more recently come to the conclusion that it'll never be done that we'll always be sort of wallowing along, trying to trying to put things together and trying to make them work together. So with that context in mind, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about security. And um, there's a few key words on the first slide. One is security, obviously. Um, threats, methods, enterprise. Um, the word enterprise is very popular. It means nothing. Um, it's supposed to mean big companies that are doing things right. But we all know how it works. How foolish that is when we look at things like HMRC. I've got to mention that very early on to get it out of the way. Um, but the trouble with security is that it's always shooting towards a moving target. And um, one of the things that has become very, very clear to me, and I was just talking to, uh, to one of you earlier about this, is that there's a number of agendas going on in, in, in the security world. And what we try to do is understand all of those agendas and then think about the poor chap in the middle of those agendas trying to make things work. And the agendas are generally that we've got a bunch of uh, IT companies that are trying to sell their latest and greatest technologies. And the problem in the security world is that they don't wait long enough for the last bunch of stuff to be implemented before they're running for the next stuff because they've got to keep their shareholders happy. So that's a big agenda going on in security. The second agenda is the business agenda. So the enterprise itself, the organization, is trying to grow its business, it's trying to go into new markets, it's uh, one minute trying to uh, comply with regulations, the next minute trying to acquire companies, etc., etc. And all those agendas can change over, in a fraction of a second almost what IT has to do. So you can put in place all these wonderful policies and suddenly, very quickly, they all have to be thrown out the window and you have to start again. And the third agenda in all of this is almost the reptilian brain of, of every human being. So um, I remember as an IT manager actually having to solve the security issues of my own staff. And they would do things like they would be um, looking at uh, rather dubious images of young ladies because they were young men and hiding them in various places on the, on, on the network. They would be um, trying to out-hack each other uh, and, and prove their prowess that way, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And those are the sorts of things that, that I was having to deal with in IT manager. So we've got all those agendas going on as well. People trying to get around things, people trying to do what they're trying to do. And we've got this poor person in the middle who's trying to pull all of these things together and, uh, and deliver something that is more secure, better able, etc., etc. Um, so, with that in mind, what we do as a company is market research. So we find out things like this. And when we ask, there are these are big screens, aren't they? Oh, I'm just going to put my hand up to the top. Right. When we ask what's, um, 
what, what are the issues out there? Uh, we, we get responses back that look something like this. And what we like to do is play around with these things and cut them in different ways, big companies versus small companies, companies that have IT security policies versus companies that haven't, except most aren't doing that well on that one, just by the way. Um, and um, But we're, here, as you can see, yes, absolutely, people are worried about that external things going on, but equally, they're worried about um, the internal stuff. And um, one of the conversations that's very big at the moment is this whole internal threat thing. Again, it's a kind of exacerbated by media frenzy around uh, the HMRC incident and so on and so forth. But it's always been an issue. Uh, I can remember two years ago, last year we put out a report called Enabling the Trusted Workforce. I think this, this particular um, piece of information was in it. How, what can organisations do in order to overcome the fact that people are human? It is what it boils down to. And the expression I like to use, I probably overuse, is um, never put down to malice what you can uh, ascribe to stupidity, um, which is it, that's that's the real nature of the beast when it comes down to it. But when we when we look at um, whether or not uh, certain risks are um, taken into account when when businesses are, are being <coughs> planned, some of the some of the issues that are actually uh, quite likely to happen are are more at the front than the issues that are less likely to happen. So, as you can see there, the, the whole kind of fraudulent stuff is somewhere in the middle. And uh, just a loss of information, downtime, it, it's all up at the top. So, it's not necessarily going to map onto what the real risks are. It's just um, these are the ways that, that people are, think, are thinking about information and, uh, and how to manage it. So, the, when when we put this stuff in place, I lost my thread there, as you can tell, um, I want to move very quickly on to the next one. Where security comes in, as far, as far as we're concerned, is around taking all of those risks, and yes, absolutely, are there security solutions to, to put in place to, to resolve them? But equally, I, I think one of, the, one of the big issues is around security is the fact that um, there's this idea that security products can somehow enable business to happen, and that's that's largely marketing. That's that's made up. Yeah, the, the idea that we can you know, put in place antivirus and we can be a better business because of it. That's not true. But what we do see, and this is what the this this particular slide indicates, is that organisations that aren't on top of their risks, aren't able to actually uh, deal with them, are actually held back. So, uh, for example, my organisation, uh, we all work from home. We don't have an office. Um, lots of very big organisations, we're only small, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not that big, great shakes. But very big organisations are trying to save money, they're trying to pretend they're green, etc., etc., by um, enabling their, their staff to work remotely. But one of the things that's holding them back is that they're so worried about their security. So that, to me, is, is, is the nub of the, the level of threat. It's not so much we're trying to remove all these threats, it's more the fact that we're trying to let the business, the organisation, the public service organisation, big or small, whatever it is, to just get on with the job it's trying to do and not feel, oh no, we can't do that because we're worried about security. Within all of that, however, it's not very easy. I mean, when we look at slides like that one, you know, what are the risks that you consider? What are the big risks? I mean, we can ask that question in so many ways. We ask it again six months later, and, it's, and, and that picture will have changed completely. And it's only by having an understanding of those risks that you can put in place uh, a security policy. Security policy sounds like a very big highfalutin thing, but as far as I'm concerned, it's just knowing what to do when someone arrives on site, when someone leaves site, when someone needs their password changing. It's just those very, very basics of process, the, the rules that you need to apply in different situations that actually have some security impact. When we want to put those things in place, we need to have an understanding of the risks. And if we're not keeping that understanding up to date all the time, it's going to be out of date and we're not going to be able to put in place policies that actually make a difference. And we see this again and again and again. Organisations put in all sorts of firewalls and then 
by the time they've implemented them, they realize all this stuff are working at home, and they go, ah, so we've still got a problem. Better put in place all these uh, VPNs, but by the time they've implemented them, they realize that their staff are all been letting their kids use their machines anyway, and they're all full of spyware, and they're running really slow, and no one can get anything done, and they're going through the back door of the VPN anyway. And so they put in place all this anti-spyware, and by the time they've done that, uh, everyone's been losing everything because they've been fed up with the slowness of the machines and sticking all their data on the USB sticks and losing them. And so they put in place, and, and, and so it goes on. We're always sort of behind the curve uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, actually delivering on, on this stuff. So I think that um, <coughs> that's an issue. It's only a model. If anyone gets the reference, then uh, you get sweet afterwards. So that's Camelot from the Monty Python film. <laughs> uh, and uh, has, if, has anyone actually seen the, the Lego version of the Camelot song? Yeah? It's got to be seen just for the moment where he points at a Lego version of that and says it's only a model. I'm sorry for that. It's just, that's just um, that's what makes me proud to be British, really, that, that level of humor. So the trouble with the way that we do security today is we treat it like this that we see security as a perimeter issue. We're trying to seal the boundaries from whatever we're trying to seal the boundaries from. And it could be things like those. I won't read them all out. But generally, and this is where those agenda things kick in. Um, you know, five years ago, six, seven years ago, it was all about antivirus. Everyone should be anti, because viruses are bad, and viruses are, and, you know, People were suffering madly from these viruses and so on and so forth. And yeah, yeah, there were lots of viruses around and there was very limited protection. So it was true. So we all put in place antivirus. And then uh, it was all about spam and it was all about phishing. It was all about, oh, and that's all going to be really nasty and lots of press. And let's face it, a lot of the IT press is actually paid for by the people who are selling these things in the first place. As are we. Okay, so before I, before I go on, I will, I will hold my hand up to that, but hopefully we're there to actually advise them not to do that, uh, as opposed to uh, advising them, yay, let's make lots more money out of it. Um, and then, of course, you know, at the moment, we know what the situation is. It's not actually about the insider threat. What it's about, from the IT vendor, security vendor perspective, is about selling data leakage protection software. That's what they're trying to do. And therefore, there's lots of stuff about this in the press. Let's talk about it, let's put out press releases about it, etc., etc. That didn't make all, all of the other things didn't suddenly go away. There, there's still issues. But um, uh, CA, Symantec, uh, etc., etc., they've got all their products they're trying to sell. They've got a, a, this whole bunch of new companies out in uh, Silicon Valley, they've got a whole bunch of VC that is around data. And someone in my position, I'm sure it's uh, the same for a lot of uh, uh, security professionals uh, possibly in this room, suddenly a term comes along like data leakage protection, like intrusion protection, like uh, all of these terms. And I think to myself, hang on, I've been in this business for 18 years, 19 years, 20 years, whatever, and I've never heard of that. Did I, did I fall asleep? You know, am, am I wrong? And then you look at it and you think, oh, it's just that, so it's a file. Thank God for that. You know, right? Okay, now I understand it. And uh, or it's, and, and a lot of these things, um, they're they're new features that have been promoted as new security products. So I'll stop going on about that. But essentially, that is the the nature of the the situation that we find ourselves in. So it's all wrong. It's all wrong. Everything's wrong about that. And if there's one lesson that we could all go away with, it's that's wrong. Okay, to think about security in this way. I used the expression um, once, and no one understood it, um, so I'll use it again, <laughs> which is that it's not about um, this boundary. Security is about permeability. Because, and you can think about it, I mean, the old expression was it's about chain as strong as the weakest link, right? But it's not about the chains and links and so on and so forth. It's about the fact that there is a level of threat that's all over the place, multi-dimensional threat, it's me, it's out there, it's everything. And there's a level of protection against that threat. But the membrane 
of protection that is created it has to work two ways. If you, for example, lock down a business entirely so that they can't communicate with their suppliers, with their customers, they ain't going to get much work done. Similarly, if you monitor every single conversation with every single person, if you implant great you know, RFID chips in our brains and make sure that you're checking when we go to the loop, we'll find out ways of getting around that. It's all about um, this kind of semi-permeable membrane that we want information to get in, we want it to get out, but we want to be able to be sure that we've minimised the risks to do, to do that. And neither do I believe that it's about monitoring everything that crosses that membrane, because that is the way that things stop happening. Uh, so it could be uh, two people, at, this is where it all falls down to. So we, we talk to companies, uh, for example, that say, yeah, we put in place some of that data leakage protection stuff. We put it in this small company, Light Engineering Works. When the CEO realized that he could no longer do what he wanted to do, he said, I set up this company, I own this company, get rid of it. I'm not having that. That's not helping me do my business. And so it's things like that. It's about making sure that we put in place technologies, processes, and the right level of policy that actually enables us to carry on and doesn't get in our way. Security is not an inhibitor. And one example of where it can all go wrong is, is, is these things. I mean, has anyone got a USB stick on them at the moment? Yeah. You also uh, um, understood the reference, so uh, you get two sweets at the end. So, I believe that we <coughs> could not live without these things right now. If you took away all the USB sticks in the world, business would start to fail. Because, oh, what do you mean? I, uh, uh, there was the thing, I mean, it happened in the States, they started sealing them up with superglue, USB ports, because they said, oh, they're a big risk, sealed them up with superglue, and then no one could work. Oh, sorry, I couldn't give you the file, ah, etc. It would be a massive inhibitor to business, to people, to individuals, to my son trying to do his homework. He called me up last night and said, I can't print from upstairs, what do I do? I said, stick it on a USB stick and put it in the computer downstairs. It's a great, brilliant piece of technology that is used by just about everybody, in particular, I mean, this evening, uh, just so you know, here's risk management for you. I left my uh, laptop power supply at home. Um, I turn up, I've got an hour's power left, and I think, what am I going to do with that hour? Right, the first thing I'll do is I'll put the presentation on a USB key. Second thing I'll do is I'll find out where on earth the lecture theatre is, and then I'll, um, I'll see what happens after that. So that was my risk management technique, if you like. And, um, but at the same time, these things are a massive security impact. There's, um, uh, one of the places I used to work, they weren't allowed to do body searches when you left the building. Now, you, know, you can get these eight, 16 gigabytes now, I think. I mean, it was 16 last time I looked. It'll be 32 the next time. You can probably fit most of the corporate database in a gig. You can probably fit all of the corporate database in two gig, four gig, eight gig, 16 gig, etc. So, one of these things, you could probably take away, I mean, the fact that, um, uh, I'm going to mention it again, I'm sorry, am I? Uh, um, the wonder of technology, I found out actually that a, a school friend of mine, uh, who I haven't spoken to since I left school, which was 20 um, god years ago, um, 22 years ago, um, found my name on the internet and got in touch and said, hello, it's me. I said, oh, yeah, what are you up to now? He said, I'm working at the HMRC. I said, oh, no. That all of the details of all of the children and all of the bank details of all of the parents and all of, of all of those children, what no one has mentioned is that it all fitted on two CD-ROMs. Isn't that incredible? You could have had ten copies of it on here. So, I mean, that's the whole country's worth of personal data fits on one of these. So what chance do we stand to? Obviously it's a massive security risk, but to take them away would be a massive security problem as well. So we've got to put in place policies that take into account the fact that it's a problem, but the fact that we want to use the technology in the first place. It's a two-edged sword. Just checking where I'm up to. Okay, well it's not mentioned on the slides yet, but I'm going to mention it now anyway, because I haven't got a graph about this. One way that we can do this 
Uh, we did some research last year into mobile technologies and mobile security. Uh, not these so much as mobile phones, uh, PDAs, um, wireless devices, etc., etc. And um, one of the sets of questions we asked, um, one of the problems with doing this job is, is you always, hindsight is a wonderfully useless thing because you always look at the answers and think, God damn, why didn't I ask that question, that question, that question. But this time we actually got it reasonably right. And we asked questions about security awareness as well as about the different things people are doing and so on. When we actually started collating the results of people who had had some level of awareness training, let's say two hours, four hours a week, you know, the whole scale, we found that just a basic level of awareness training cuts by an order of magnitude the likelihood of things going wrong in that, order, in that organization. So we just compared one set of questions which were all about when did you last have a problem? with another set of questions about, more or less, how aware are you, how well trained are you in, in, in these things. And the results were staggering when we, when we put those two things together. So, one of the things about, we're never going to get rid of these. They're, they're the necessary evil, if you like, or the necessary great thing, as far, as far as I'm concerned. But what every organization can do that's very, very easy to do, is just sit down with everyone in that organization and say, let me tell you about our security policy. And the security policy itself doesn't have to be very complicated. It just has to say what are the things that people should do, shouldn't do, etc. And there could be some very, very simple things that absolutely have to happen. You must put a PIN number on your mobile phone. Absolutely. Anyone that's found without a PIN number on their mobile phone will be told to have one. Great. You've got a policy statement. And that would probably solve... 20% of the risk in the whole organization, because most of the likelihood of something going wrong is probably someone losing their mobile phone with a bunch of corporate data on it. That's just one of those things. So it's just an example of where, um, of how things can be done about this that are absolutely nothing to do with technology. Speaking of mobile, um, and speaking of an example, of, I mean, the hype around the iPhone has just been absolutely great, is not it? It's... Uh, Totally impressive. We, we, we watch these things. I mean, I, I'm so just so you know, I'm running uh, Ubuntu Linux on my laptop, um, but that doesn't mean I hate Microsoft. I actually think that Microsoft do some great software. I just don't want to use it on my laptop, which is fine. But the camps that you know, as I said about agendas before, the open source camp hate Microsoft, but they love Apple because Apple runs Unix, so they must be okay. And it's this kind of funny relationship that all the different camps have. And uh, the fact that um, they totally locked down the iPhone, which also runs Unix, and uh, if, you try and, if you try and unlock it, it'll then throw you out completely and you can't uh, repair it, uh, just is an indication of something that's very, very wrong. But people don't mind, because it's Steve Jobs, hooray! So um, that's, the, that's the industry we're really in, and uh, that, that's what we're up to here. But with all that in mind, I do want to um, ask the question about, yeah, so, can technology app actually help? What we tend to find, so here's an example, antivirus is missing off the list, but it's right at the top and it's up at 90%. Okay? Um, what we tend to find is that what people have actually implemented in uh, security technologies is basically the easy stuff. So antivirus, absolutely. VPN, yep. Uh, Anti-spam, all that content filtering, you kind of stuff, etc., etc. They've got some HR policies, so we'll chuck them in as well. But essentially, up at the top is the easy stuff. What's down at the bottom is the hard stuff. It's the stuff that really needs you to have an up-to-date security. Identity management um, is the area where you're, you have to understand the roles of everybody, what they're up to, what they're trying to do, what data they need, what processes they need, what workflows, what uh, applications they need, etc., etc., and then you can manage everything across the board. It's right down at the bottom of the list because it's so blooming hard. And one of the issues that we're going to face as we move into these new technologies that are coming up, for example, virtualization, orchestration of uh, uh, resources, etc., etc., are but they're all going to be around identity management. So there's going to be a big issue that's coming up. That's my, we don't normally make predictions, but just for your own make one. It's going to be 
Identity management is going to be a big problem for many organizations. They're not going to be able to provision virtual machines, extra storage, etc., etc., in that dynamic way without having an understanding of who they're provisioning it to and how. Right at the bottom of the list, we talk to a number of security vendors that say the future's in forensics. And we say, yeah, but the trouble is no one's buying it. Um, because uh, everyone thinks that security isn't their problem. And um, my um, memory of... Uh, so who here is actually running uh, computer systems? So, oh, of course. Of course. My understanding, I'm looking for a nod, so you can tell me it's totally different, it's all changed since my day, is that the best way to get funding for security technologies is the day after something went horribly wrong. And you go to, I used to work with a CFO, or finance director, as he was called then in France. Went to him and said, can I have some of this stuff? Can I, have, I mean, it was, um, it was everything. I mean, I needed training for, for the people that were working for me. We needed um, uh, various protections. We needed the firewall -y kind of stuff. We needed all these, you know, just simple, basic, security-related technologies that would really help. And uh, equally, um, simple um, things like you know, backup management, those sorts of things that you don't really need that, he would say. And I would have this issue where, and you can sort of dress this up in language that uses terms like business case. So what people, you know, if you read it in a book, it'll say, what you need to do is put together a business case that maps out the benefits and the value, and it uses all those terms. What that meant to me in reality was, I would go to him and I'd say, can I have it? And he'd say, do you really need it? I'd say, nah. well, I don't absolutely need it. It could be useful for this, this, and this reason. He'd say, well, nah. And that would be that, and I wouldn't be able to justify it. So the business case would be lost at that point. Uh, I guess I could have put in, you know, 14 hours and work out an absolutely watertight business case. But like a, running an IT department, as you know, isn't as simple as taking that 14 hours out just to find a bit of time to uh, work out the need for some security software. But the day after something went wrong, like the day we all came in one morning and all of our servers were empty of data, was a day that he would sign anything. So we all became wonderfully uh, trained up Unix experts, we got uh, reporting software, we got extra servers to monitor the other servers, it was all brilliant, I tell you, it was fantastic. Um, and the good news was we got the data back, which, uh, and, uh, uh, does anyone here run Unix systems? Hey! <laughs> so, um, is anyone, anyone Unix literate at all? Okay, so, uh, what I can tell you about that little incident was it was nothing to do with malice and everything to do with... Cleaning and plugging something? Nope. Not running uh, the find certain directory minus... RM minus F <laughs> on a remote machine and forgetting the fact that it'll strip off the quotes when you do that. So it found every directory including slash and um, when it found it, it deleted every directory including slash. But of course, once it had found slash, it deleted that and then uh, it didn't find anything else. And so it got lots of errors saying it couldn't find everything else, which was uh, kind of bizarre. So, the, that's the issue. But so back to what we do with the research. Um, generally, when we look at this sort of thing, we start to find uh, certain correlations with, in terms of uh, not just have you put these sorts of things in place, but then we look into you know, have you got any policies in place, and also what kinds of more complex capabilities do we have? And the example I gave earlier about the awareness training sort of thing, we see similar things where people actually have implemented things around, for example, the more advanced authentication mechanisms, centralized security management, identity management, forensics, those sorts of things. The organizations that have implemented those, more than one of those things, tend to be the organizations that are more on the front foot when it comes to security. They'll already have decent policies in place. So it's not that these things help them, it's that they're the organizations that actually understand how to make best use of this kind of technology. Um, that's pretty much everything I was going to say about it. I mean, essentially, no, I'm not going to waffle on about this anymore because I've, I've pretty much made the point. Generally, in 
most organisations today, when we ask questions about how good are you at this stuff, and it's very, it's quite hard to ask questions about. Um, so tell me, are you rubbish? <laughs> so we have to be quite clever how, how we ask that kind of question. We say, are you rubbish? No, of course I'm not. We're brilliant. Ah, okay. How good are you? Oh, well, I'm not that good. So there, there, there's ways of phrasing these things. But it does wind me up when uh, people in the kind of privileged position that I'm in say that everyone's rubbish. Because actually I've been there and I know that most organisations today, they are being berated by the users, they are trying to keep going a whole bunch of legacy equipment, they have got massive cost pressures, virtually no budget, they've been told they can't spend anything on new developments, it's all going to come out of existing funding, and then they get smacked over the back of the head because it's not working properly. Um, so given all of that, uh, a lot of the time what organisations are doing today is they're in coping strategies, they're just trying to uh, make sure that things are just keeping going at all and not necessarily getting onto those more highfalutin things about uh, uh, making those onward improvements. So a lot, of, um, a lot of things that we're talking about, when we get over, philosoph over philosophical about these things, we end up with maturity models. So if you know the uh, capability maturity model for software, yeah, you can go from, uh, um, I can't remember the stages, but from ad hoc to managed to something to optimized. Every single technology area could map onto some kind of maturity model. Security, you generally go from a situation where you don't really know what, what the situation is, so it's not so much ad hoc as um, ignorance, to a situation where you know exactly what the situation is and you're running scared and you try and do something about the very the worst bits. Um, so we could think of a term for that. That could be uh, coping to a situation where you're starting to actually be on the front foot and you're able to see a bit more ahead, which would be more of a kind of managed, and then to a situation where, and I've never seen any company like this, but wouldn't it be great if we had a situation where you know exactly what you're talking to the business all the time, they trust you, you're sitting there in the boardrooms and you're advising them on security, and they're then telling you what's going to come up and you're telling them what the risk's going to be and they're giving you money to sort it all out in advance and uh, that would be sort of called strategic. So we could end up with some kind of uh, maturity model around, around security as well. But the fact is we never get there. It, it, it's more an <coughs> aspirational thing than it is um, a real thing in most organisations. Why don't we get there? So, I think I've covered a lot of these things already, but I think it's worth just running through them again. Yeah, go on then. Broader risk understanding. What does that mean? It means that people don't really get what the problems might be. In some situations, uh, we're like teenagers with cars. We sort of, we can drive them, we can sort of get from A to B, but you know, some old buffer might say to us, ah, oh, but, you know, you need to go on that advanced motoring course and understand the dangers of skidding on, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, what happens if you hit a hot bit of tar or you start to uh, hit a lot of rainfall on the road or that sort of thing. Um, those sorts of things we don't get because they never happen to us. And so it's very, very difficult to, um, to understand it. And we're sort of, a, I was talking to a guy earlier who, who, who runs a small security consultancy. I met, met up with him on the way down here. And we were talking about the car analogy, and we sort of, I sort of said, well, it's, it's sort of like driving without a seatbelt on. And he said, well, it's like driving without a seatbelt on and, um, and uh, with, with, you know, without airbags. And we ended up sort of working through all of these things. And I said, well, yeah, it's sort of like driving without a seatbelt on, without a chassis, probably with, all the, with your leg hanging out and, 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 and so on. And that's the kind of situation that we're in, but it's all changing so fast, so it does make it very hard to get that if just understanding rapidly changing context. Data proliferation is a very interesting one. I've talked about USB sticks right now. I think there are several trends that are impacting data proliferation. One of them is bizarrely the fact that over the past five years we've seen a massive wave of consolidation that's ongoing. So what happened was uh, we had this thing called Y2K and everyone said it's going to be terrible and everyone listened. And so those people spent lots of money on consultancy and so forth, and everyone was wrong. 
And then we had a thing called the euro. That's going to be terrible. And then we had a thing called e-commerce. It's going to be great. And all of these things were wrong and wrong and wrong. And then we had a thing that everyone's going to be doing this mobile thing. And I remember um, wireless, uh, what was the thing going to be? It was where we were going to link GPS on our phones and it was going to tell us where the nearest pizza was going to be and the, everything was going to be so brilliant. That was back in about 2002 and that's when the bubble burst. And what happened post the bubble bursting is that major IT departments, minor IT departments asked one simple question which was great but it really damaged the IT industry which was probably also great because it needed this big shock. And the question they asked was, do we really need this? So all of those things they've been implementing before just to keep up the competition, CRM, um, all the security related stuff, um, all of those things, ASPs, yeah, we need to, yeah, but they were rubbish as well. All of those things led real companies to ask the question, do we really need to do these things? And the IT industry just plummeted. The telecoms industry just went down the tubes. With the result, the only money that people started spending was on consolidation projects. It was to make things more efficient. So if you watched at the time, as I was then just becoming an analyst, suddenly, weirdly, everyone seemed to be interested in things like grid computing, blade servers, data center stuff, IT management. IT service management wasn't the term coined then, but it was what was happening at ITIL, um, and so on and so forth. So that meant that, because that's... That's where, that was the only place that anyone was spending any money. So the IT industry, that was the only thing that they were talking about. Trouble with that, and I hold my hand up to this as well, as an ex-IT manager, is that it put the control in the hands of people like me. And not where it used to be in the hands of the, uh, the business units that used to run their own IT. Consolidated it all down, put it in the hands of control freaks, Timbok generals, that said, it's my data center. You want a server provision? Uh, yep. Okay. About three weeks. And, um, oh, I've forgotten the whole outsourcing thing as well. About four weeks. Yep. So, so that's all happened. And what, as a result of that, has happened is when things like uh, Salesforce.com came along and said, we've got this great new thing, it's called How You Can Manage Your Customers, you access it over the internet. It was the sales department that was buying those things. Blackberry Enterprise Server. All the people walking around with Blackberries, it was the sales department, it was the finance department, it was the people, um, it was the service department buying the things. And it's meant that with the IT, thought it was totally in control. Ha ha, I've got you now, I've got my own IT department all organised. And meanwhile, so we've got all these things bop, 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 appearing. And that's where data proliferation is coming from. Databases <coughs> within the business units with absolutely zero security attached to them, because literally, it's a Linux server under someone's desk running MySQL, or, or whatever. And it's really, so um, BT is a great example. BT at the moment has got its application rationalization project. I think they've got something like uh, 800 little applications out there in the business that they're trying to deal with. And it was a real eye-opener to me. You know, the, um, I don't know if anyone's gone through the, the they had things like Home Highway, and then they had highway, business highway. What you don't realise, I can't remember the exact terms, but it was things like that. What you don't realise is that home highway was running a different customer database to highway, which was running a different customer database to business highway. And if you thought you were buying home highway and you called up and you said, I've got problems with my highway, they wouldn't know where the information was. So that's why they've got this massive program at the moment, trying to get it all back under control. Um, that's going to carry on. I mean, the, the, the situation that we have in terms of um, these things, mobility, PDAs, etc., etc., it ain't going to get any easier. And um, probably for the right reasons, because technologies such as mobile phones are actually having a transforming effect on, on, on how we do business and how we live our lives, etc., etc. And it means that we can actually coordinate. Is anyone here using Twitter, by the way? I, I, I should have twittered the fact that I was here, but I forgot, which means that nobody knows. You should probably really know. Uh, have a look up Twitter. All the social networking stuff that's happening totally outside the IT department. Microblogging, totally outside the IT department. But companies that get it right, again, BT, if you look at J.T. Rangwasami, who's uh, working for Al um, 
who's actually the CTO of BT, they're trying out all this stuff, the social networking stuff, to actually work out how they can reach their customers. And it's actually bringing in business for them. So it's not about locking down the data center. It's about trying to work out how all these things work. But each of them comes with really big issues around security. How do you manage a blog? Robert Scoble, anyone heard of Robert Scoble? The, he's kind of a really, he's the geek blogger. Um, and if you look at it, he looks like the guy in uh, The Incredibles, I'm your number one fan. Yeah, he, he's that kind of archetypal geek and he's become a blogger. But he was blogging for Microsoft for a whole while um, and saying things that Microsoft marketing didn't authorize. But they had to let him do it because he was so popular. How do you deal with it? What, where, where does that appear in the security policy? How, how, how do you write that down? How, how do you capture that? Separation of concerns. Um, talking to HSBC, I say I was talking to HSBC. I had a brief chat with one of the guys from HSBC following a presentation that they did at a security uh, event in London last week. What they've actually done is they brought together their IT security function with their business fraud function which makes a lot of sense because it's all about risk management. So that's a very clever thing to do from a business perspective. It means that they can coordinate training, it means that they can coordinate those low level things like forensics and so on and so forth. Uh, I did ask him, shouldn't they be, um, that's when I did have the brief chat, maybe they should be linking that in with the credit risk side of things, uh, but we all know what a state that's in, um, so maybe that would be a step too far. But what we are seeing in a number of organizations, and we're getting this out of our research, is how it, it's that who polices the police thing. So is the IT manager really the right person to be in control of security? Or should it be a business function that's kept separate from IT? Because if the IT person isn't actually trustworthy, and he says, yeah, yeah, it's all secure, absolutely, how do you know? It's one of these really, really difficult questions. I know um, when I was an IT manager that no one ever asked me the really difficult stuff like, can we trust you? Can we trust you to run our IT? And uh, it, it, it's a really sort of dangerous area to be in because actually you're undermining relationships inside your own organization. But what we are seeing, which makes a lot of sense in many organizations, is that they actually have a separate security risk management, chief risk officer, chief policy officer, some of the terms used, to oversee the way that the security is done across the organization, and then not to try and undermine how IT is implementing it, but to try and support IT in delivering whatever's necessary in order to, uh, to help support those policies. Last point I'll make, um, this boundary protection versus deperimeterization question, it, it, it's massive, I mean it's hugely difficult, we try and lock everything down, and it, it's like the data center, thing. we try and lock everything down and it all goes pop, pop, pop all over the place, we try and open it up and we lose complete control, it, it's about getting that balance between the two. I know, has anyone heard of the Jericho Forum? It's um, a kind of, it's a, um, how to describe it, a loose-knit bunch of uh, chief information security officers that are very outspoken and are trying to define how they would like to see security, they were talking massively about deperimeterization. Like, we want to open up our perimeters, and everyone went, ah, you can't do that. But what they've actually come to as, as a, a really sound approach to um, securing some of these very big organizations, people in, in that, uh, um, Eli Lilly, the pharmaceuticals company, um, I think Pfizer's in there, uh, so some very big pharmaceuticals companies, very big banks, etc., etc. they're looking at this. What they've actually said, and this is how it was explained to me, so sorry if it comes across wrong, they want to secure every single computer in their organization as if there was no perimeter on the organization. So they want one set of policies for this. If I suddenly have this computer and I take it home, the same set of policies apply. If I have that computer and I'm sitting in an airport terminal, etc., etc., etc. So they only have to think about the risks once, the policies once, and whatever needs to run on this, you know, network access protection or uh, anti-spyware or VPN, they just do it all once. And then they can say, you're free to go, off you go, you can run that computer at home, you can, uh, you can run that computer in the airport, in the hotel, you can, hopefully you can, you can leave it somewhere and it can get nicked and it won't matter as much 
because we've already worked out what the risks are for that computer. So that's really what the where the deparameterization argument is going. It's about it's not about let a free for all. It's more about let's be realistic. We should be acting as though anyone can freely access our networks, which is probably the right way around. I did say um, we, we like to play around with data. Um, so what this says is, <coughs> I've totally forgot what this one means actually. Essentially, there are different Yeah, okay. So, what we can see from this, if you look at the very top bar, for example, let's take it one bar at a time, is that organizations want that 80% uh, on that top bar to coordinate policy between business and IT. To have, uh, and there's various ways of phrasing that, but essentially what this is showing, and that top bar is an indication of this, is that, and, and it's where you end up with motherhood. If we just ask that kind of question, so. And it, it is where, why almost that, that bar gives me an indication of why I feel good about my job, because those are the kinds of questions we try and find out. What we could have asked in that top question is, is it important to coordinate policy between IT and the business? And everyone's going to go, well, yeah. And that's kind of motherhood. That it's really sort of dull. It doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you that, is, it, is common sense important? Yes, absolutely. Of course it is. Um, but what this is actually showing is, yes, okay, people find it important, but equally, only 50% of organizations have actually implemented it. And similarly, 60% of organizations are saying that they would love to have integrated security across all different systems, so things like identity management, things like centralized security management, etc., etc. but only 20% have actually implemented it. Hence the point at the top of the slide, which is where I lost my thread just now, Yes, we have a way to go in, a, in, a, in order to actually achieve these things. And it's all down to those, a lot of those reasons that I just gave around what's holding organisations back. Similarly, in smaller organisations, they don't see these things as quite so important as the larger organisations, but they do see them as very important. And equally, they're not half as advanced as the larger organisations. So, to the point, we've all got a long way to go when it comes to actually achieving the goals of security. And it's one of those, I, I, I think it's one of those slides and one, one of those um, images that I hold with me when people say, I um, um, was asked the question earlier about you know, how good are people really? Um, and it's where we, where we try to strike a really big balance between, it's not just about saying everybody should be doing integrated stuff, because everyone knows that. So if I just said that to you, it would be motherhood. But really what the issue is, is how we can get 50% to become 80% and the 20% to become 60% in the larger organisations. It's how can we get from from um, from one side, how can we how can we close that gap? Where to start? This is my um, this is my summary slide, if you like. Um, so uh, if you have any questions after this or, or now, uh, I can leave this up. Uh, where to start with closing that gap? I think, uh, hopefully I've, I've made this point often enough, it's that security exists to enable business. It is fundamentally, fundamental to me. Right now, back to the HMRC example, there's this idea that everything should be locked down. That anyone that's acting in an insecure way, and it's all very big brother, you know, every, you know there should be cameras everywhere following everyone, and oh, shouldn't have done that, oh, watch what you're doing there, you're going to drop it, etc., etc. Businesses, organisations in general, are not going to function very well in that way. However, what we can do with security is reduce the risks to a level that the business itself can, um, can move forward. And so we've used examples like, um, I'll, I'll make up another one. Give everyone Blackberries, but only give everyone Blackberries if it's actually going to be done in a way that manages the risks of giving them Blackberries. A really interesting thing happening in a lot of businesses right now is they're actually not giving out computers or they're not giving out mobile phones. They're giving people money and saying, there's a bit of extra money, you go and choose your own. But 
If you do choose your own, it's got to be able to do the following. It's got to be able to run that, that, and that application. It's got to be able to um, run that, that, and that security policy, etc. And that enables the, the people on the ground to actually be free to choose um, whether or not they've got Bluetooth headsets or, or whatever. So they're actually feeling good about their work and, and how they do it. But equally, you're in control of, um, of, of the security situation that created. Risk mitigation, not avoidance. So that's such an obvious no-brainer to anyone that's worked in anything to do with the military um, when they brought out the Review of Protective Security back in 1995. Um, up until then, all um, UK MOD defence kind of work was based on the principle that every single risk needs to be avoided. And uh, so you needed big walls and lockdown and security guards and barbed wire and everything else. And then they said, hang on, it's expensive and it's not achieving anything. Uh, or it's not actually reducing the level of risk particularly. So they said, okay, mitigation. What are the risks? What are the likelihoods of those risks happening? How can we reduce those risks to a level that makes sense? And it may be nothing to do with security. It may be entirely some organisations to do with culture and we see, that can be seen again and again if you've got organisations that care about uh, I'm, I'm making this up but I would imagine that Google is like that they have a massively tight uh, policy of um, non-disclosure anyone that even goes into the site uh, goes into Google's offices have to sign a non-disclosure group just in case they see anything that might uh, give away but it's all made up I mean, it's rubbish you know it's not likely to happen, but they have this culture of security uh, that everyone's really proud to uphold. Um, and other organisations, you see them, um, one organisation actually has to go and do some uh, awareness training yeah, for a government department, um, in the, uh, not, not in the defence side of things. Uh, and they, they really didn't care, they had, you know, they had their passwords on post-its, everyone did on, yeah, on the backs of their desks. Uh, they were sort of lending out, oh, I can't access the system, oh, well, use my password then. Sort of attitude to, um, to security, no one cared, no one saw it as important. So, get the culture right, for example, and you're already mitigating a, a large number of the risks. Balance trust with prevention. Um, talked about this, acceptable behaviour, acceptable use policies um, are very, very useful if you haven't got them in place. Um, and uh, make policy enforceable. I, I think that's crucial because we see time and again organisations that put in place very complex policies, generally because everyone's put an oar in, and they all say, oh, well, we need that in the policy, we need that in the policy, and so on and so forth. We end up with very long policies that are ne never kept up to date, and, uh, and um, no, one, no one keeps them anyway. Yeah, whatever. Um, I, I, that's the kind of, the, the last statement is motherhood entirely. Um, but I'll chuck it on anyway. Make ownership the first step, wouldn't it be nice? Um, I, I guess this is just something that I talk about with my kids, but it's all about personal responsibility. And I, you say things like that and you hope it makes sense and one day maybe, uh, maybe it'll go in. But um, certainly organisations that get security get that it's their problem, and organisations that don't see it as someone else's problem. So it's more, uh, ownership is more a symptom that it is a cause, I, I think, in the whole thing. There we go. I hope that helps. Um, give you some idea of uh, the changing threat landscape and what we can all do about it a little bit. I mean, are there any questions at that point? Is that all rubbish and did you know it all? Or any? <laughs> did you um, list some of the people that you've done work for? In terms of uh, consulting for, or? yeah, um, you threw, or sorry, you you, um, you displayed some statistics there. I'm thinking of uh, who provided you with those. What organisation? So, right. What so, sector? so when 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 we when we do the research, it um, tends to depend from project to project uh, who the exact organisations are, and. Uh, we don't give out their specific names because it's all anonymous. But uh, generally, um, it's a long-winded way of also saying, I don't know. 
But in the report that that came from, there will be a sector distribution that will tell you, you know, there was 25% from finance, 25% uh, from telco, retail, manufacturing, or it'll be um, those but in Britain, France, Germany, or it, that particular one was a pan-European study. I do know that. But I can't remember the exact proportions. Do you find that there is a disparity between, say, um, I mean, maybe the generalisation of this question doesn't make it uh, informative, but I'm thinking of uh, if you've done uh, research in uh, Europe uh, versus North America, is there a disparity between their approach, the two approaches? Um, Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, we, we've just completed a study, in fact, uh, under the heading of information governance, um, which looks into different attitudes to risk in uh, a number of European countries, the US, and a number of uh, Asia-Pacific countries. So Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, um, Malaysia, I think we, we covered. And um, one of the, I mean, so when I mentioned agendas before, one of the fascinating things about bit, what changes a great deal uh, is the business agenda in, in the different geographies. So here, for example, uh, we'd really like to be good eggs and do everything right. And so it's all about good governance. And uh, governance, to me, um, um, again, it's one of those terms that suddenly appears and everyone's saying, oh, well, it's all about governance. And you sort of think, oh, great, what, what's that mean? Um, because it just wasn't in my lingo 18 months ago, it wasn't in anyone's lingo, but everyone's talking about it like it always was. Um, but essentially, it's, a, it's the same stuff as we did with TQM, uh, Total Quality Management Zero Defects, back in the day. It's about good management, it's about quality systems, it's about uh, knowing what you're going to do before you do it and check that you've done it afterwards. Uh, and we're all about that um, in Europe in general. We're not about what the US is about, which is compliance. And uh, when um, again, thinking about the, the IT industry agendas, we get a lot of IT industry agendas from the US. <coughs> so a lot of uh, uh, rhetoric that comes out of the IT companies is all around compliance. And oh, we need compliance, you need records management for compliance. Compliance is terrible, you need good compliance, etc., 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 which does impact certain companies. But it's a far bigger issue in, in, in the US because they're all running scared of Enron. And uh, up until, I mean, business in the US until very recently was uh, deregulated, whereas business in Europe until very recently was exceedingly regulated, and now it's been deregulated to the point that it's not quite so exceedingly regulated. Um, but, you know, we uh, gave a presentation in, uh, in India a few months ago, and we were, uh, we were uh, the biggest laugh I got was when I talked about bureaucracies. Um, because uh, we, we were arguing about who's got the oldest bureaucracy in the world uh, between Britain and India. Um, but you know, we, we understand bureaucracy, whereas in the US, um, US businesses didn't have to until quite recently, so it, it's a far bigger issue for them. So security, as far as um, national differences are concerned, um, I, I was an IT manager in France, um, but we certainly do see the, the kind of stereotypes kicking in. So in the US, um, very much people are complying because they have to, but they avoid it if they can. In France, they love creating laws and they love breaking them. Uh, in Germany, they feel they should create laws and keep to them. And in Britain, they hate creating laws and they hate breaking them.